listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello and welcome to the Becoming Who You Are podcast. This episode is a very special edition because in it you're going to hear a conversation that I had with a woman called Stephanie Murphy from Pork Therapy. I've posted conversations that I have, I've had with Stephanie before on this podcast. Um, she's a very good friend of mine. She also runs a radio show of her own and she's a very talented voiceover artist as you're about to discover. Because the reason that I was talking to Stephanie this time is because she's just finished narrating and producing the audiobook version of The Ultimate Guide to Journaling, which is my all-you-need-to-know resource on journaling, out now. So Stephanie and I sat down and we had a conversation about the book, about why I think journaling is so important, about why I think rational personal development is so important, and a lot more, as you're about to hear. You might notice Stephanie's voice is quite familiar. That's because she also did the introduction to this podcast. So she is the person that you now hear at the beginning and end of every Becoming Who You Are episode. If you'd like to find out more about Stephanie's radio show and her voice work talents, please go to Pork Therapy. That's P-O-R-C therapy.com. And of course, as always, if you want to find out more about me and the work that I'm doing over at Becoming Who You Are and more about journaling and authentic living and all the wonderful things that that can bring to your life, please go to becomingwhoyouare.net. I hope you enjoy this episode and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Sit back, relax, because here we go. It's a pork therapy bonus show. Oh, yeah. Hello, and welcome to a bonus edition of Pork Therapy. Today, I have something very, very special in store for you all. We are going behind the scenes, and uh, we're not only going behind the scenes with Pork Therapy, we are going behind the scenes with a very good friend of mine. Her name is Hannah, and she's got a website called Becoming Who You Are. And Hannah, first of all, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here with me. Well, thank you so much for having me back. Yes, Hannah has been on Pork Therapy before, and I hope she comes back again because I love talking with her both on and off the air. And um, we've had some great chats. We talked at Pork Fest on on uh, Pork Therapy. Oh God, so many porks! But anyway, <laughs> we we had a chat at the Porcupine <laughs> Freedom Festival, and we had another chat too about um, about traveling and where to live for freedom. And I hope I hope there will be many many more. I've. Uh, Hannah has a podcast that goes along with Becoming Who You Are as well, right? It's the Becoming Who You Are podcast, which is going to be ramping up, I guess, a little bit more here in coming months. She's already got some content planned for it. There's some stuff on the feed now, but maybe it uh, wasn't updated as frequently in the past, but now she's going to be ramping up with it, right? Yeah, that's right. Cool. So there's, uh, so she's got a podcast, uh, a blog, and Becoming Who You Are, in case you're wondering, uh, we're going to talk a lot more about that, but what what is becoming who you are in just you know a couple words, I guess, Hannah, or more than a few words? Becoming who you are is an online resource that is um, designed to be the guide to authentic living, um, but with a very specific perspective. So it's using rational personal development. I like rational personal development. Uh, for completely emotional and nonsensical reasons. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) I like the idea of rational personal development because I think uh, myself and probably some other people uh, who are in my audience who listen to Pork Therapy might be thinking like, yeah, I like the idea of like self-improvement and like working on myself and, and knowing myself better, but I'm not so into the like, you know, crystals and spirituality and kind of like mystical side that is sometimes attached to the concepts of attempting to know oneself and to heal from unpleasant feelings and, and past traumas and stuff like that. So uh, can you tell me a little more about what you mean by, by rational personal development specifically? Um, I think that's a great point that you brought up and I, I definitely share your perspective on that and your feeling about it. I, I guess through my own personal development journey, I have really noticed that there's a lot of um, what I call woo-woo involved in the um, yep. in the personal development movement. So there's a lot of people that talk about um, 
making miracles happen and um well wait a minute it wouldn't be a miracle if you could make it happen right <laughs> aren't you supposed to pray for well, a miracle yeah, and I then mean, that's, that's, that's maybe one you'll receive one that you could ask them but um <laughs> I, I it's not something that i've ever found i've been particularly able to relate to so yeah it was really important to me when i was looking into the stuff myself and you know putting my own self-knowledge and working on my own personal life that I could find resources that um, fit in with my own values. So I really value rationality. I really value logic and reason and truth. Mm -hmm. And um, I definitely um, value things that exist um, far more than things that don't exist or that there's no real evidence that they do exist. Mm -hmm. Um, So with becoming who you are, what I really wanted to do was provide that for other people. Um, I found it quite hard at times to separate out you know there'll be people who whose ideas i would love but then they would be incredibly mystical um which again like i said i found quite hard to relate to so what i wanted to do is separate out all the really good stuff that i i've sort of learned myself and that i've been thinking about along the way and provide it in a kind of woo free way <laughs> woo free. now with 100 percent less woo becoming who you are <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I'm totally on board with that. Of course, I, I really support your venture. And I think that it fills a, a really important niche, you know, like the whole thing about your website is it's authentic living, right? And so by explicitly embracing rational personal development, you are not only being true to your own values and your interests and the way that you want to approach your project, but you're also enabling the people who are, you know, willing to hear that message to be way more authentic with themselves. And so I just think it's really compatible all the way around. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I I really appreciate you saying that. And I think it is really important to me as well, because one of the things that I, I realized when I was figuring out why I disliked all this kind of mystical stuff so much is that there's something really disempowering about it to me. And what I mean by that is that I think when people put a lot of focus on an external figure or energy or anything like that, they're automatically taking that sense of control and power away from themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, So actually, I think, I mean, I I can definitely understand and see that it's useful, things like religion and everything are useful as a support structure for people. Um, And often there's a lot lot of cultural and social conditioning involved in that as well. But for me, when I look at it from the outside, I think if you are putting all your your kind of energy and your your focus on on this external being or energy or, you know, something like that, Mm -hmm. then you're not actually harnessing that for yourself and thinking, no, I am responsible for what happens in my life. I'm responsible for the decisions that I make. I have complete control over what happens. And therefore, you know, I'm, I'm the one that can either make it a, a, a life that I find fulfilling or a life that I don't. Mm. Yeah. And I can waiting for something else to happen to you rather than making it happen. Yeah. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I see another area in there where we can empower ourselves by realizing that we can understand the world in a way that doesn't contradict itself, you know, in a logical fashion Mm. that makes sense. Because so often, you know, I hear people who are dealing with grief or dealing with something that's happened to them that they don't understand. Maybe it's a really sad or terrible circumstance. And they get they get told by some of these like gurus or people who maybe have a more like higher woo factor that well everything happens for a reason right the lord works in mysterious ways and everything happens for a reason mm-hmm. the universe has a plan for you wait a minute so are you telling me that this really shitty thing that just happened to me happened to me for a reason <laughs> is, is it did i deserve yeah, this absolutely. crappy thing that happened uh <laughs> or you know are you telling me that the the good thing that happened to me was not a result of my hard work my actions my my attempts to bring you know pleasant things into my life it just happened because the universe had a plan uh i think that's an incredibly yeah disempowering kind of message. And so I'm, I'm really happy to see people sort of taking control of their lives and realizing that, yeah, like 
actions have consequences, right? There are causes and effects to the, to those things, but we can understand them, right? And the more that we work on ourselves, the more that we grow as people, we can understand, you know, why we've made certain choices in the past and we have the power to change them, right? As we grow as people. And it's not mm-hmm. just, it's not just that we're going to go through life and things are going to happen to us for some nebulous reason that we can never understand because it's like a cosmic plan you know uh absolutely yeah and i i think that's a great point and something that goes hand in hand with that for me as well is that there is no set way that you're supposed to react to things like that happening Mm -hmm. so a lot of um a lot of religions and a lot of um frameworks for personal development have this this almost um match of how you should respond to things so um for example buddhism is something that i i became quite interested in at one point i would never have described myself as a buddhist but i i read a couple of books and everything and i mean i'm by no means an expert and i just want to put out that caveat but something that really put me off it is that there's a lot in there about letting go of anger and letting go like this this phrase letting go um really bothered me because i i kind of thought well if that's the feeling you're having, then that's the feeling you're having. And it's tough to tell someone, basically, you, know, you shouldn't be having that feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, and I, I think that's another thing is that, and that's something that I try really hard to do in becoming who you are, is to make it really clear that this is not a, like, I'm not going to start giving you a prescriptive way of living here, um, because I, I respect the fact that everyone is very different and everyone has their own way of processing the world as well. Um, I guess the framework that I come from, that I come at this from is a rational framework, but beyond that, I I respect the fact that people are more than capable of making their own choices. And I don't think there is necessarily a set way that people should or should not live their life. I think the thing about authenticity is that you do what's right for you. Like you, you go on this kind of journey where you discover what, what really is right for you and not necessarily the conditioning or what people have told you you should do or the belief that you've been brought up with your true authentic self what is right and that you are true to that yeah so in a sense it's not my saying or what anyone else is saying it's 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 about being able to have enough self-awareness inside and say yeah this is really to believe this is what this is what's important to me Mm -hmm. yeah i i agree with that and i appreciate that you have that perspective And I also think that part of living authentically is accepting yourself, you know, accepting the feelings that you feel, regardless of whether, you know, you have a voice criticizing them and saying, oh, yeah, it's wrong to be mad at this person or it's wrong to hold a grudge or whatever. If you feel angry or you feel resentful or you feel something, you know, that's just how you feel. And to, you know, to move past that feeling eventually, you have to let yourself feel it. You have to process that feeling and think about it. And I mean, there, there is a rational way to do that instead of just saying, well, I shouldn't feel this way or feeling guilty for, you know, whatever you feel. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, it does a great quote by Nathaniel Brenner that I'm really struggling to remember now, but, um, it, it, it's something like the first step to change is acceptance. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a, it's a pretty tricky notion that you have to, if there's something that you want to change or something that you don't feel 100% satisfied with, I'm really wary of using that word change because it, sounds, it does sound a little bit like it belongs to the whole self-improvement school of thought that a sense that we have to constantly be better. But, I mean, we all have things about ourselves that we, you know, I definitely have things about myself that I, I look at or I think that I hear myself say and I think, you know, I, I really like to that to be different. Mm-hmm. And the really tricky thing about it is that if you kind of constantly berating yourself for doing that thing or being that way, it's never going to change because you're just going to end up polarizing the part of you that's berating part of you that, you know, for whatever reason you're doing that thing. Um, and I've definitely experienced that myself, that the first step to changing anything is being able to accept it to begin with because then you're far more able to empathize with yourself and to understand why you're doing and then you you know, potentially understand how you can meet the need you're trying to meet, uh, meet in that thing, to, you know, and actually change that in the future. That's all very abstract. I don't know if it makes sense. Oh, no, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I guess just maybe to clarify... <laughs> for people who aren't, who are like just learning or just uh, finding out about this kind of stuff, there is this concept 
I guess, in a style of self-therapy called or, or formal therapy called internal family systems therapy. They, you know, they look at it as people have parts within them and each part is kind of like a person and, you know, it's, it's kind of like its own person with feelings and needs and things that it likes to say and its own style and personality. And sometimes these part of uh, these parts of us can get like provoked. Sometimes they can fight with each other. Sometimes they can kind of unconsciously enter the driver's seat and control our behavior a little bit unless we become conscious of them and we listen to them. And the reason that they're driving our behavior is because they have something they want to say. They want to speak up and be heard and receive some empathy perhaps from from us, from our master self or whatever you want to call it. And, uh, you know, then they may quiet down once they feel like they've been heard and we won't be driving our, they won't be driving our behavior so unconsciously, right? So I'm kind of, I guess, combining a little bit the concepts of nonviolent communication, you know, connecting empathetically with another person or in this case, another voice that's within yourself and trying to really hear the feelings and needs behind what it's saying and to, uh, you know, yeah. allow an empathetic connection to form. And also the concept of internal family systems therapy with the parts, which, uh, which you talk about a lot, Hannah, and, um, and, and sort of like understanding all the different parts that are making up our very complex selves. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Cause I, I guess it's something that I, in our conversations offline and, um, sometimes but of course this is a conversation with your listeners as well and they might not be that familiar so i really appreciate you clarifying that and uh, i think the voice gets so people who um if you're listening and you're not quite sure what we're talking about i guess the thing that is often the easiest to identify for people is what's called the inner critic and i think it's, mm-hmm. it's called something different in internal family systems but um i think that's that's often the most the easiest voice to identify because for a lot of people it really goes in a rampage in certain situations. Um, and so, so that that would be a good example and uh, you know, probably quite an interesting if you're thinking of exploring your internal dialogue. Mm-hmm. It's just, just to um, to notice when your inner critic comes up and sort of question that and why is that coming up now and what is the, why would my inner critic um, criticize me at this point? What are they trying to achieve by that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I want to use this part of the conversation as a springboard to talk about your most recent project, I guess, or one of your most recent recent projects, which is a book about journaling as it relates to personal development. But first, I just wanted to quickly revisit a point that I wanted to talk about a little earlier when we were talking about sort of what is becoming who you are and what is the concept of rational personal development. Now, I think that there are lots of people out there who... Um, you know, perhaps there are people who are drawn to the kind of more woo, for lack of a better word, types of personal development because they, you know, they feel comfortable about uh, talking about emotions, about expressing emotions and things like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, there might be some other people out there who are more, who consider themselves more of the rational uh, ilk, right? Maybe are not so comfortable with delving into emotions. You know, maybe they actively have sort of a a disdain, you know, like they're almost like a Mr. Spock kind of character. (laughs) And of course, (laughs) not everybody is like that, but just, I know there are lots of people out there and I've even been in a place that's similar to this in the past where, you know, they're, they really value logic and rationality and Mm. they associate that value with a de-emphasis on talking about feelings or processing emotions. And I really... I think that there a lot of those people out there could benefit from a site like yours because it's it's really a false dichotomy be- between you know rationality or feelings. It's really not that. Yes. I mean, there are people out there who say or neuroscientists out there who say that not just people but <laughs> scientists who say that scientists you know, are people too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> but people who who make a career out of studying this stuff that say that forty percent of our brains are dedicated to processing emotions, and that is across genders, across cultures, across everybody. And so, you know, mm. we are human beings first and foremost, and we have a lot of CPU space essentially, a lot of real estate in our brains that's devoted to feelings and processing feelings, and so. That's a, yeah. a really important part of 
ourselves, of our the computer that is our brain. And so if you are a person who values rationality and logic, then, you know, perhaps you're interested in this from more of a neuroscience angle, but it's really important. I hope, I hope those people could see the value in really processing their emotions and uh, figuring out how they can best like work with those and incorporate that the emotional person that they are into their self, you know, honor their emotions and honor their feelings. Absolutely. I, I think that's a great point. And I can definitely relate to that as well, because I was very much that person um, several years ago where I, and I think part of the thing for me was that I had all these emotions that I just did not understand. And I thought I was completely irrational. And I, I really didn't like that about myself mm. um, it, because I, I placed a lot of importance on being a rational person, as I still do. Mm-hmm. But I think the thing that really helped me, and this is something that I, I'm really glad you brought that up because I'm, I really want to emphasize this, is that it doesn't always feel this way, but your emotions are always rational. Mm-hmm. So even if you feel something and you think, oh, that's a really, what, you know, why am I feeling this in response to this situation? Or why am I feeling this in response to this person? That doesn't make any sense. I promise you on some level, it will always make sense. There will always be a really good reason why you feel that way. It might be nothing to do with that situation or that person, but there will be a reason. We don't just make up emotions out of nowhere. I mean, emotions are very scientific in a way. It's, it's like chemistry. When you have, when you put two things together, there's a chemical reaction and a, a product at the end. And the emotion, any emotion that you feel, is going to be a product of a combination of things. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the one thing I would say for I guess people who could maybe identify with what you were just talking about, as, as I definitely could once. But there is. there is a real logic to it. It doesn't always feel like it. And sometimes it feels bizarre and scary and um, and exhilarating at the same time. And it feels like you, you know, you you go through periods where you don't necessarily feel anything and then you feel this rush of emotions all at once. And it's really hard to understand, but everything, everything that goes on with emotions is logical. And it really bugs me that that there is this sort of uh, societal concept that, um, people who people who talk about their emotions are irrational because to me it's mm. the most rational thing that we <laughs> that we experience you know mm-hmm. it just happens naturally we have these emotional reactions to things naturally and they are always completely rational on one level or another yeah yeah our brains are making a lot of calculations too and sometimes things how to put this well sometimes things will come out in the form of a so-called gut feeling but it's really just your brain synthesizing a lot of complex information that not all of it are you necessarily conscious of, right? And so absolutely, yeah, yeah. Gut feelings are amazing in that way because you can have a feeling about, like for example, when you first meet someone, um, and I think we probably all can relate to this experience on one time or another. When you meet someone, and essentially they seem really nice, but there's this part of you that's like, I'm not sure about this person. There's just something weird here, and I, I can't. I have no idea what it is. And, and for me, the dialogue after that usually goes, well, maybe I'm just being a bit unfair, but I, I have always been right. It's <laughs> <laughs> always been, um, I've always been a bit of a generalization. But when I, when I think about the times when I've, I've, um, when I've had that experience that I can remember, mm. um, I, it's definitely, there's, there's been a reason. Right. Right. It, it is like a very important survival thing, right? It makes sense that that function has evolved, that humans would be able to essentially make judgments about other people in order to maximally be able to protect themselves or to spot, mm-hmm. you know, people that they might really form great relationships with, right, from the beginning. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think that can apply in a lot of different situations. Um, so tell me about... Um, the concept of journaling for personal development. You have written a book about journaling. It's called The Ultimate Guide to Journaling. And it is, (laughs) I could speak from experience, it is the ultimate guide to journaling. Uh, You've got got all kinds of stuff in there, but can you just give us a, maybe right now, a brief overview of why would somebody want, first of all, what is journaling? And why would somebody want to do journaling 
to work on themselves? That's a really good question. And the, <laughs> it sounds very funny to say this, having written a book about it, but the answer to the question, what is journaling, is actually really hard because <laughs> um, it's, I mean, I say in the book, it can be whatever you want it to be. And I think that's, that's one of the great things about it is that, I mean, when people think about journaling, if it's not something they've ever really done that much or if they have a very kind of um, stereotype notion of it, it might be, you might visit someone sitting down with their moleskin notebook and <laughs> kind of um, writing, you know, I don't know, love letters or whatever um, that will never get sent and all this kind of stuff. And it generally can absolutely be that. But um there's, as I, as I try to include in the book, there's all these different kind of uh, suggestions and ideas and I don't want to say techniques because that sounds a little bit harsh but, mm-hmm. um, or a little bit cold. But, yeah, I guess different kind of exercises that you can use to really explore your, who you are and your, your internal dialogue, your internal workings, the way that you really see the world and really become conscious about it. I think that's the main thing is that journaling – the act of journaling itself is really helpful for making, bringing things from the unconscious into the conscious. And also, I talk about something in the book called retrospecting, which I think is really, really important as well. And it's definitely something that's provided the most value to me in my journaling. And retrospecting is going back and looking over um, your journaling entries from the past. Um, so I, I don't want to stop at written journaling as well, because another reason that I think journaling is great is that, you know, write, writing is not for everybody. There are some people who don't particularly enjoy it um, or, I don't know, don't feel, maybe don't feel they're very good at it. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't really matter. But I think the really great thing about journaling as well is that you can totally do journaling if you are. Um, and equally, if you're more of a writer than an artist, you can still do it. It doesn't matter how good you are. Um, I I always make the joke that I have trouble drawing stick men. <laughs> I'm that bad <laughs> at art. But I, um, I I still have gotten a lot out of doing artistic journaling rather than purely just writing. So it, it really is whatever you want to make from it. And um, it's a fantastic self-therapy tool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, cool. That's a That's a great introduction. And I like it that in the book you really treat journaling as something that can take a ton of different forms. It's really like whatever's most helpful to you. But at the same time, it does have a clear purpose. It's to help you become conscious of things that you might not have really been consciously aware of before. It's to help you get in touch with parts of yourself that have maybe not had a chance to speak up. And it's to, you know, it's basically a self-care activity. It's to care for yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the way the way that I experience that it, it's really meeting parts of yourself for the first time. And that, again, it sounds a little bit trippy, but what I mean by that is that we all have these, um, kind of like what I was talking about earlier, we all have these thoughts and feelings that we feel. And then there's part of us which says, no, you're not, you're not supposed to feel that way. It's wrong to feel that way. Mm-hmm. And what happens is that those feelings and those thoughts or those beliefs that come up get kind of buried, I guess, beneath. The, the idea or the concept that we're not supposed to think that way or that we're wrong for thinking that way or that, you know, our, our, we're going to get rejected if we think that way, if we express that. Um, and with journaling, you really have space to explore those feelings and those thoughts and to make it conscious why you believe that and why you think that and why you feel that. And then to decide for yourself, well, is this something that, for example, is this something that I truly believe, that I truly think that I truly feel, or do I believe and can feel that because I was told that I should when I was a kid or because I had a teacher who, you know, that like punished me for doing that once or something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, you know, tell me about the book, you know, I guess that's a little bit about journaling. Why, you know, why write a book about journaling and why was this something that uh, was important to you to share with people in the form of a book? I wrote the book because I've gotten a huge amount out of journaling myself. I'd probably say um, I I did several years of therapy as well, um, and that was probably the most valuable thing that I that I did as far as my personal development goes. But journaling is one of those things that um, it was just amazing as a kind of complementary tool, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing with therapy is that I 
I know that therapy kind of has a stigma, and so not everyone really necessarily wants to do that. Not everyone wants, and it's expensive as well. I mean, mm. I, I don't know what it's like in the States, but certainly in the UK, um, there is definitely a cost factor involved. So oh, it yeah. can feel quite prohibitive <laughs> to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I was really aware, and I talked to a lot of people who really got a lot out of journaling as well, and I was really aware of how valuable it was for people who didn't necessarily afford to do therapy or for other reasons might not want to do therapy. And it's a really great way of doing what I call self-therapy. Mm -hmm. um, um, when I was exploring it myself, I did a lot of research, I did a lot of reading, um, because I, when I kind of realized how much it was helping me, I just wanted to learn everything that I could about it, and I wanted to kind of get my hands on all the books that were out about it, and just immerse myself in it, basically. And I did that for a few years, and the result of it was that I then thought, you know, it would be really cool to put all this together in a book and kind of provide the resource for people that... I didn't have in the beginning um, because all the information in there is information that you know I've sort of either worked out myself along the way or I've, I've got it from a lot of different places so I wanted to put it all together in one place so it's like that's why it's called the ultimate guide to journaling um, because it's intended to be a kind of all-in-one resource so the first couple of sections explore um, what journaling is and how to do it and the different options you have and kind of goes into the details that I got really stuck on when I first started um, so I constantly had this thought of, am I doing this right? And of course, there, I mean, what I discovered is there isn't really such a thing as right or wrong when it comes to how you do your journaling. But I had all these questions about, well, how many times a week should you do it? And what time of day should you do it? And, you know, that I, I didn't really ever feel like I could find a clear answer about that. Mm -hmm. And so I explore all those different options in the book just so that people reading it know what their options are basically and can kind of I guess choose the journaling choose their way of journaling that's right for them um, right and then the second part of the book I, I give I think in the end over 100 different prompts and suggestions and ideas mm -hmm. that you can use sort of different techniques for journaling like I mentioned earlier yeah and those are so cool like um so there's there are so many different directions you can go with this book. It's like not even funny. I mean not only do you have a hundred <laughs> more than a hundred different prompts for journaling, which I think people will probably find their favorite ones. They may go back to them over and over again or they may try to try experimenting with each one so like they could do mm. an unlimited amount of different things with it but then there are also the different media of journaling so there's like you could draw pictures to journal you could use words you could journal online you can journal in a notebook you could you know you could record voice record your journal entries you could record your dreams and try to figure them i mean so there are all kinds of things that somebody can do and i totally agree with you that if somebody is uncomfortable for whatever reason, with the idea of working with a therapist, or maybe if they can't afford it, this is like a really fast and easy and affordable way to do some of this stuff on your own and get really, uh, I think you could get really high yield results from this process in terms of uh, self-knowledge. All it takes is the willingness to sit down and kind of work on it which I think for some people, that's the biggest thing that they need to get over, you know, before they're able to, to journal, mm. they have this resistance to it. And you, you do talk about that in the book, trying to like, you know, if you feel resistance to journaling, let's think about that. You know, why, why do you think you feel resistant? Is there something that's very uncomfortable for you that may come up during journaling about a particular topic? And, you know, mm. how can we process those feelings of, discomfort and resistance before even starting to journal about whatever it is that's triggering those feelings, right? Yeah, absolutely. That, that was definitely something that I experienced a lot because I, like I said before, I came into personal development from being quite a hard-ass rationalist beforehand. And there was definitely a part of me that was really cynical about the whole thing. And so I would be sitting there trying to journal and write stuff down and kind of work out what the hell was going on for me. And there'd be this voice, which is like, this is such a pile of shit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Why, you know, what are you doing? Come on. <laughs> and right. it's really, really important, um, even though, you know, like we were talking about the inner critic earlier. Yeah, it's really important to give that voice a seat and say, okay, why, like, what is the fear here? Why, why do you not want me to do this? And for me, what came up was that this is going to be really hard. And, you know, if you 
it's like opening Pandora's box. If you start getting into this stuff, it's going to lead to some really deep stuff um, mm. underneath. And yeah, that was a pretty accurate fear, I think. Um, ultimately, it was a really good thing. But yeah, there are some aspects of journaling that can be quite hard as well. And so the resistance, I think, is really, it can be really kind of demotivating for a lot of people. It was for me, certainly. Um, and it can come up in a number of different ways as well. Like another defense mechanism of mine was that there was always something more important to do. So I would sit down to journal. And <laughs> I'm familiar and with that do, feeling. <laughs> I'm just going to do my laundry. I really suddenly have this burning urge to do all that washing up that's been sitting there for weeks, you know, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah, it can be a great way to get the laundry done, actually. Like, try to do something you want to do even less <laughs> than the laundry. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, I, the resistance, like I said before, all your emotions are rational. That resistance is always there for a reason. So actually exploring it. Um, you know, I, I was thinking when you were talking about the resistance that when it comes up, that's actually the great, a great thing to journal about first. And obviously you need to get to the point where you feel comfortable doing that to begin with. But, um, yeah, it could be fascinating to work out, okay, why am I feeling so much resistance to this? Mm -hmm. um, why, you know, surely, because on, on the surface, surely it's quite a harmless activity. So why am I so reluctant to do it? And the answer is probably going to start you down that path to becoming more self-aware. Right. Yeah. That's a great, uh, great way to address those uh, feelings, which I'm sure are going to come up for pretty much everyone who <laughs> undertakes a process like this. So I guess I just want to, I guess I just want to start by, you know, congratulating and acknowledging the bravery uh, of anybody who's even thinking about going down, you know, getting on a journaling uh, regimen or program. I don't, I don't really want to call it like a regimen, but like, you know, looking to do some journaling. How about we call it that? I, I want to acknowledge yeah, their bravery. Yeah, I, I call it a journaling practice in the book. But practice. To be honest, I'm not 100% happy with that because it sounds a bit like, you know, doing your homework or something. <laughs> it doesn't sound very free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think, you know, especially over time, it becomes something that people really recognize the value in. And w even when uncomfortable things may come up while they're journaling, they 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 see the value in doing it like they feel good mm -hmm. after doing it because they have been you know engaging in authenticity and they've been exploring themselves and like who doesn't want to explore themselves right i mean <laughs> that's that's uh it it's really something that enriches our lives in the long run i think we can say oh yeah definitely it's in, it's incredibly rewarding and one thing i would say about the the sort of harder times is that I, I probably, if I were to go back um, to when I first started journaling and do my whole, do the whole journaling process again, um, which is obviously a process that's still ongoing, but um, just kind of be a beginner journaler again, I think I would be a lot more conscious about balancing out stuff that felt really hard to explore with some more lighter fun stuff. So one of the reasons that I ended up feeling quite a lot of resistance to journaling um, after I've been doing it for a while, I had the beginning resistance, but then I also had um, a lot more resistance come up after a while. And that was because I was exploring some really hard stuff. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I felt, whenever I sat down to journal, it would be like, oh God, you know, not again. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many more, how many more times am I going to have to go to these really difficult places and Oh, just it was so demotivating. Even though I knew deep down that it was kind of like going to the gym and <laughs> pushing past your kind of fitness feeling, and it, it feels horrible while you're doing it. But right, um, right. Over time, it it's really helpful. That's kind of the way that I experienced that whole period of my my journaling. Um, and I think if I were to go back again, and what I would kind of um, suggest to other people now is, if you're in a period like that, definitely balance it out with other stuff. So one thing that I've what discovered I love doing since then, which is really fun, is like making lists, which sounds really mm -hmm. banal, but um, I mean like bucket lists and you know, a hundred mm -hmm. things I want to do by the time I'm 30 or 40 or whatever, places I want to see and wacky experiences I want to have and just things like that, which seem kind of unimportant and superficial, but actually are A, really helpful because they kind of get your creativity blowing and they take you out of this really dark, serious place mm -hmm. and kind of 
you know, which helps you get a different perspective on it when you go back there as well. But um, so they, they kind of help you lighten your mood a little bit. And, and they also prevent journaling from becoming this kind of drudge task. It just feels really painful and difficult. Mm. And yeah, they've also given, I mean, just taking a list example, it's also given me some great ideas for stuff that I want to do with my life that, again, I wasn't really that conscious of wanting to do before, but it, the thought came up, I wrote it down, and I was actually like, yeah, I would love to do that. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, there are lots of unexpected things that can come up during journaling and a lot of them are like, Hey, it's a pleasant surprise. So uh, yeah, there you go. You never know what gems you might find. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this hard, this, I think that's what I really want to say is that there is hard stuff that comes up. And I, I talk about that at the beginning of the book, because like I said, I, I definitely experienced that in my own journaling and I, I don't, I, I think it would be kind of, um, maybe not unfair, but remiss to, sort of make out that it's all amazing and it's so fun and you know everything is mm -hmm. there are really hard times but there are also really good times as well and I mean I, I've definitely had a lot of really positive experiences and um, I'm working towards creating more positive experiences that I wouldn't necessarily have um, recognized if I hadn't been journaling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah that makes sense. So um, can you tell me about some of the feedback you've gotten after writing this book like what have people said about it I mean, we can talk about our own experiences, but I'm kind of curious how this has been working out for other people. Yeah, um, the feedback has been really great, actually, and I, I've been really happy to hear that um, people have really gotten a lot out of the book, especially the, the um, I think the thing that people have commented on most is the amount of suggestions that I include in the second part of the book, mm -hmm. and um, the fact that there's stuff for writing and stuff for art um, but a couple of people also said you know it's really helpful just to um, have all the options that you have to create your own journaling practice set out at the beginning as well um, so yeah I mean this is, this is just a little plug for the book so far it's had all five star reviews on Amazon <laughs> so that's that's really really good yeah and I'm I'm really pleased to hear that I, I'm, I'm really I mean it's it's cool for me because this is the first book I've written and I self-published it. And so it felt like a bit of a risk for me because I know that this is all information that I would have found really helpful. And it's information that I did find helpful when I eventually either worked it out for myself or, you know, read it elsewhere or whatever. Um, but there's always that question. It's like, oh, is this actually going to be helpful for other people? And or is it, you know, are they going to buy it thinking, great, ultimate guys journaling, awesome. And then think, well, you know, it, that was a bit of a waste of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was kind of my nightmare scenario. So um, it's really validating to hear that other people have found it really helpful too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was kind of expecting to hear that uh, there would be a really positive response to this book. Um, I mean, have you had feedback from like a wide variety of people? Uh, I guess I'm just curious, like who journals, I don't know, maybe that's a little bit of a strange question, but like, this is for everybody, right? I think of journaling as something that could yes. appeal to anyone, right? And so yes. do you have any idea of like, sort of who who is doing this or who your audience is, I guess? Interestingly enough, I mean, I have had, I haven't had, um, it's, diff it's always difficult to know because I don't know who is actually buying it. I just get the the numbers that come up through Amazon and now through um, from the audiobook sales as well, but I can't actually see specific individuals mm -hmm. who have um, purchased the book. So I, I don't know, for example, what the split of ages is and what the split of genders is. Um, and I, so I don't know if the feedback that I've received is um, statistics-wise or demographic-wise is representative of who is buying the book as a whole. But the interesting thing is that... Um, most of the feedback I received, I actually received more feedback from men than from women. Mm -hmm. And I was not expecting that. Um, yeah. Maybe that is a, a belief that I'm making conscious on my part. But <laughs> I've always, um, I guess because it is more an emotion-based activity and it's very much something that you do to explore, to get past the thoughts and to explore the feelings underneath. Um, I've always, and then some of the other German communities I've been in, it's been predominantly female. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty surprised that um, most of the feedback I've had have actually been from men that read it, mm -hmm. um, but also really pleased because I, I don't think that it is something that should just be for women. 
Yeah. Um, I think I think it's actually maybe even slightly more valuable to men because there is this kind of cultural notion that men don't talk about their feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think I think actually being being a man in today's society and wanting to explore your feelings is really tough. I think it's actually harder oh, for yeah. men than it's for women because it's just there's a lot of um, social circles where that just isn't acceptable. Mm-hmm. So I was really glad to see that actually a lot of men have obviously bought the book as well. Um, yeah, and, that's cool. So maybe yeah. you're, you're reaching out to the the ones who kind of got taught to believe that they had to be Mr. Spock when they're grown up, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, may, maybe, maybe. Mr. I, Spock I, or I do Mrs. Kind of Spock. I so because I, I think that that whole cliche is incredibly damaging. Yeah, I think so too. Definitely. Yeah, so maybe this is... This, you know, even if somebody does have that really strong conditioning or impression from their young life that they're not supposed to talk about or explore their feelings, maybe they would feel comfortable doing it in a totally, in a context that's only for them, like their journal that nobody reads, that's completely private. You know, maybe that's the first way that they could crack open the door to their feelings to getting in touch with them without feeling embarrassed because they would be doing it in more in public. Absolutely. I think that's one of the most helpful things about journaling is that, um, like I said before, it kind of gives you the space to explore stuff that you're worried might not be acceptable. So um, for me, even though I was also in therapy at the time, I explored a lot of stuff through journaling first and I I acknowledged a lot of stuff to myself through my journaling first before I felt confident enough to talk about it with even my therapist, Mm -hmm. let alone anyone else. And this was someone who I built up a very close relationship with as well. Um, and that was really, you know, I honestly don't know if half of that stuff I, I would have ended up talking about with, with them um, if I hadn't explored it through journaling first. Right. And I think that's a really important thing about journaling. And I, I do talk about this in the book as this question of like whether it should be private or not. And obviously, again, that is a completely individual decision. But I, I think it, my personal opinion is that it should be private or at least you know, maybe later down, further down the line, if you want to show people sections from it or whatever, you know, talk to people you trust, like your friends or your partners about certain things that are happening to you or certain things you realized or like fun things or whatever. That's, that's great. But if you, if you write it thinking, oh, so-and-so might read this, you're going to be self-censoring and it's not going to be particularly helpful for you. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that is the beauty of journaling and having a private thing that's just for you. Um, It enables you to say things that you just wouldn't feel comfortable saying in front of anyone else. And I guess that's that might be obvious, but it's really important to point that out because that might be the only thing that some people are comfortable with. So uh, that's cool. Yeah, Uh, it really gives you. I mean, it really gives you a space to explore your authentic self and what you really think and feel away from the influence of other people's opinions and other people's reactions and worrying what they might think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think, I think the privacy side is really valuable. Right. Right. So, okay. The thing that we haven't mentioned yet, but we're going to get to is that, um, we, you and I, Hannah have worked together on a project that relates to your book, the ultimate guide to journaling. And that was that I made an audiobook version of this book. So yeah. I, I want to talk a little bit about the audiobook and how that could be different from the um, ebook, you know, version. And is there a paper version or is it pretty much just an ebook? No, it's an ebook. So it's available um, this week, actually. Um, not only did the audiobook come out, but it also I also distributed it through um, a company called Smashwords, and now it's available in pretty much all ebook formats. Before mm-hmm. it was only available for Amazon, but now you can get it uh, on, for Kindle, PDF, for your Nook, for whatever other. There's lots of different formats <laughs> mm. that I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's like Sony e-reader and stuff like that as well. Cool. But um, and you can get your wonderful ebook uh, audiobook as well. Um, which has been amazingly narrated by Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the audiobook, the process of making it. So first of all, um, Hannah and I got together, and we, 
you know, she said, you know, look, I've written these two eBooks and I'm really excited about them. And, you know, we were both kind of wondering if these books would work as audiobooks. And we're still kind of talking about the other one, but we decided definitely, yes, the journaling, uh, the ultimate guide to journaling, uh, I think that would be like a really cool project for an audiobook. It's not terribly long, but it's packed with information and it could be really useful for somebody who wants to maybe maybe get that sense of connection by hearing a human being read the book and ask them questions about themselves like uh you know what what are some of your you know what are some of the things that you learned about gender when growing up or whatever. Some people really would like to hear another person speaking to them to get the most out of thinking about that question and trying to connect with parts of themselves, you know? And so, um, so an audiobook might really appeal to some people for that reason. Another thing about an audiobook is, you know, just like a, a print book, what you can do is listen to the audiobook and we've put in a sound of a little sound effect every time that there's a journaling prompt. So you'll, you'll hear this little bell and in a very Pavlovian fashion with punishments and rewards. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you'll hear this little bell and you can stop down and, and write, uh, write about that prompt. You know, you can just pause the book and, or insert a little bookmark or whatever you want. And so it's very open in that way that you can, you know, you can listen to a little of the book, stop it, maybe rewind it or go, you know, go to a different chapter, whatever you want and, um, and use it that way. And if you're voice recording your prompts, you could even, you know, play the audiobook and then voice record your answer. So you, you could have the whole thing on audio. And that way, when you want to look back on it in retrospect, you can listen to your voice, um, speaking the, uh, answer to the prompt or whatever. And you can, you can kind of hear that in context, get a little more information from the way that your voice sounds and the words that you were using and everything. So, um, so I, I really had fun making the audiobook, and I hope that it's useful to some people. The whole thing is about two hours long. We've got a little, um, narration from there in Hannah. Actually, she makes a cameo guest appearance in the audiobook. <laughs> And, uh, so that's cool. She's, uh, you know, speaking the introduction in her own words and the rest of the book is, is my narration and it's got, you know, sound effects throughout. So, you know, when a new chapter is starting and you don't get bored and you can hear these pretty chimes and stuff. Hope that doesn't sound too woo. I don't think so, but <laughs> chimes, you know. No, it, it sounds, when, when it comes out the actual video, it, it, it sounds great. I, I I wasn't quite sure what to expect, I guess, because um, you sent me the finished version. That was the first version I heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't quite sure what I was expecting but, um, or what to expect from what you told me about it. But it completely blew past any expectations that I had about quality and the way it will fit together and um, how how helpful I think it could be for people just because it really does add that personal touch. Mm. And obviously you have... Uh, a lovely voice <laughs> Thank you. For, for doing narration and really warm and friendly. And I, I think it works really, really well. Cool. Thanks, Anna. I'm so glad that you're, that you you're enjoying it and you like it. I certainly had a lot of fun making it. And, uh, there are even some Easter eggs in there. If you, um, <laughs> if you get the audiobook, you can hear me doing a skit where I am playing <laughs> Hannah's inner critic or one of Hannah's inner critics, the Victorian governess. And I do a fake British accent for this. So that is, <laughs> that is not to be missed. There's a, there's a, a couple of other parts that are really cool in the book. You can hear a preview of it, by the way, if you go to Hannah's website, becoming who you are.net and you'll find, you know, there's a place where you can click to find the book, the ultimate guide to journaling. I think you'll see it pretty much right away when you go to the website, but um, there is a page that contains uh, the ebook, links to buy the ebook, and a link to download the audiobook. And next to the audiobook link, there is a preview. Um, so if you click on that um, that player or that link, you can hear a two minute preview of the Ultimate Guide to Journaling audiobook and see if you like it. Yeah, anything to add, Hannah? <laughs> No, I think I, I was just thinking, is there anything I want to add? But I think you, you summed it up perfectly there, yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, so um, I hope you I hope you check this book out. 
um, you know, whether you're more into an ebook format or you're into the audiobook version, I highly recommend both of them. Uh, I had so much fun working with Hannah on this project, and I was like so excited to share the audiobook with her because I knew. Um, I knew it was just going to be like a really fun thing for both of us. And I'm, I'm looking forward to working with her again in the future. And um, is there anything else that you want to say before we wrap up the show, Hannah? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually tempted even just to go as far as to say, <laughs> even if you're not that interested in channeling, um, the Victorian governor's get alone is worth the <laughs> $6 the book is on sale for. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's Stephanie, if you've never heard her before. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, thank you. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. And yeah, I guess maybe we could talk a little bit about um, the distribution for the uh, audiobook. I mean, I don't know how detailed you want to get, but the audiobook is being independently distributed by Hannah, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's right. And uh, that. Yeah, so you can only buy it through the Becoming Who You Are website. Mm-hmm. So this is exclusive, exclusive to becomingwhoyouare.net. And do you have like a quick. Uh, URL. I, I've actually on the Pork Therapy website, you know, p o r c therapy dot com. I've put a link on the right hand sidebar, as well as in the audiobooks tab at the top of the page, to the Ultimate Guide to Journaling audiobook uh, and ebook. So it's right there on the front page of my website and on the audiobooks tab, which is up in the menu. So it should be fairly easy to find if you go to my website. And of course, if you just go directly to becomingwhoyouare.net, you can find the uh, page where you can download the book or audiobook there as well. And it's probably, I'm guessing it's very conspicuous on your site too, Hannah. Yeah, it is. And thank you so much to uh, for linking to it from Pork Therapy. Um, mm. I really appreciate that. If you go to my website, it's on my homepage. I have a little slider on my homepage, mm-hmm. and um, one of the three, uh, as you can tell, I'm not very technical. One of the three sliders that pops up is um, the Ultimate Guide to Journaling, and it's also in the sidebar. It's got a blue cover, so yes. it's, it's pretty difficult to miss once you're actually on the website. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, and by the way, also at your website, you uh, Offer, you have a lot of different things on your website. You, you've got the blog, which is free, and you've yep. got a bunch of really popular blog posts. I recommend that people check them out. On your about page, which you just recently have updated, you've gotten you've got a link to like you know if someone is new to the website, which blog posts might they like to check out first? And I think that might be really yeah. helpful for some people. Um, uh, actually, you said that the most popular post that you've ever written is called Forgiveness is Overrated, right? Yeah, Why Forgiveness is Overrated. Mm-hmm. So if that yeah. interests you, you, you may want to check out the post. And you've also got, um, you've got two e-books, you know, the journaling book that we mentioned, and also you've got a basically like a course called Four Weeks of Self-Knowledge, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a four week, that's slightly different to the journaling book. So the journaling book is simply a book that you can read in your own time. And the four weeks of self-knowledge is an email course. So when you sign up, you get an ebook with it's a sentence completion course. So when you sign up, you get an ebook telling you all about sentence completion and what it is and sort of how to make the most of doing it. And then you get an email a day for 28 days, which is four weeks. And um, it provides you with a set of prompts for each day. Yes. And I have to recommend that too. Um, I actually did this course when it was in slightly different form. At the time when I did it, it was actually 12 weeks of self-knowledge. So I did a little more, <laughs> a little more hardcore version of it, I guess. And yeah. I found it. <laughs> Kudos for getting through that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I, I loved it. I mean, I thought it was worth it. You know, sentence completion is very similar to journaling in that it's a really quick, um, I would say shortcut, but it's really not like cutting corners or sacrificing quality. It's just a really um, direct and easy way to get to the root of, you know, some of the things that that are in your subconscious uh, to get to know yourself better and to think about things in your life. So I I really like the style of sentence completion. Of course, um, one of the first things I did when I got interested, this is before I knew you, Hannah, but when I got interested in um, self-knowledge or personal development, one of the first things I did was the sentence stems that Nathaniel Brandon has on his website, and he's got a workbook called The Art of 
self-discovery. So if you are familiar with either of those, or if you're interested, if, if that just sounds interesting to you, then I think you would really enjoy Hannah's sentences. They're, I guess, a little more, um, a little more updated. You know, she's got an email course. She's got sort of more online format for, for sentence completions. And I just can't recommend them highly enough. (laughs) They're really, really cool. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think, again, sentence completion was one of those tools that I found really valuable. Um, and I have, I continue to find really valuable in my in my own sort of self-exploration. And um, I've tried to design the course to make it as easy as possible. So it really does only take 10 minutes a day. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll send you an email every day so you don't even have to remember to do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I have an email to send you in your inbox each morning. Um, giving you the sentences for that day and yeah this it's designed so that you know I, I appreciate a lot of people are very busy and they might not feel like they have the time to really sit down and spend you know hours upon hours journaling or doing mm-hmm. whatever each week so this is designed to be sort of really short but as effective as possible in the time yeah yeah I mean how <laughs> if you're having trouble getting motivated how much uh, how much easier could it be than to get an email every day and say, okay, you know, set, set aside 10 minutes starting now and fill out these sentence stems. That's all you have to do. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's quite a nice compliment to journaling as well, because it, it is slightly more directed. So with journaling, you know, when you, when you sit down to do it, or I, don't know, I guess some people are going to do it standing up. I keep saying sitting down, but generally when you sit down to do it, um, it's up to you what you want to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas with sentence terms, um, I will email you the first part of the sentence and then you complete it. Mm-hmm. So it, it is it is like journaling in the sense that you're exploring what, what certain um, cultural or familiar beliefs mean to you um, and what certain aspects of your life mean to you, but it's also slightly more directed. So right. again, I, I kind of want to remove as many barriers to entry as possible, and I think that's a great way of doing it. It's just say to people, okay, this is what we're talking about this week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, you can go back at the end of the week and look back on what you've written. And then sometimes, you know, like when people are filling out sentence stems, I know Nathaniel Brandon and you also said, you know, don't, don't overthink it. Just kind of go write them out. Don't spend too much time on it because that can be a way to like really let your subconscious just take over. And then later Mm. on you go back and look at it and you read what you wrote. And sometimes you're like, I wrote that. I can't believe I wrote that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty incredible when that happens. And that's one of the great things about sentence completion is that, um, so a lot of people in the beginning ask me, you know, why am I, I why am I getting the same sentences every day for a week? Mm-hmm. Um, so the way the course is structured, you get um, you get several sentences per day, but then those repeat throughout the week. Nice. Um, I think in the new course, it's actually they change every half week, yeah. so it's slightly shorter. Mm-hmm. But um, the whole reason the repetition happens is so that you can get past the thinking part of your brain and get to the feeling part. So you you're not supposed to think about it when you read the first half of the sentence you just write down five answers whatever comes up for you first and what i found anyway and i I think um from the sounds of it you had a similar experience stephanie that um you get the first couple of days you do it it's like well the first couple of times you do it like yeah yeah i knew all this already but then (laughs) suddenly there'll be something that comes up and it'll be like whoa (laughs) yeah (laughs) where did that come from yeah that's that's very interesting (laughs) Yeah, I've even gone and looked back at sentence endings that I've written like years ago and thought, oh, man, I can't believe I wasn't, you know, (laughs) I can't believe that I wrote that or that I wasn't conscious of this at the time or like now I'm I have so much more clarity about this or whatever, you know, and uh, just want to also reiterate something that, you know, something like sentence completions, it's not like a woo thing where you're doing like automatic writing or whatever, you know, like there was in the seventies, there were these people who claimed that they could close their eyes and write with a pen and like a spirit would be taking over their body and writing. No, that's not what this is. (laughs) This is just basically, (laughs) this is just basically allowing your, allowing your subconscious and some of the things that have been buried and repressed to, cause we all have those things, right. To try to come out and give them a little bit of a voice and then later on look back on it and get in touch with those things so that we can become conscious of them and process them and hopefully grow from that experience. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's it's one hundred percent possession free. There's nothing there's nothing <laughs> weird or freaky involved. It's it's just the whole point of it is basically that, you know, we we all have our defenses about certain things and the repetition is designed so that you can kind of get past those defenses and see what's underneath. And it's it, it's it, it sounds a little abstract when I talk about it without being able to really show what that looks like because obviously it's, it, it happens differently to different people. But um, it there is no weirdness involved in it at all. It's a very natural process. Mm-hmm. And again, the whole you know our defenses are there for a very rational reason. Um, they, they exist because of the experiences that we've had, and uh, you know they exist for our self protection as well. Um, so yeah, it, it is all very rational based. There is no um, spirit <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. involved. Yeah. So, so again, you know, uh, and it's just for you. That's that's the other thing to reiterate. You know, it's yeah. We even have defenses from ourselves, I guess that becomes so integrated. Like you say in the journaling book, you know, people adapt to what they experience throughout their lives. Like people are very adaptable. Human beings are incredibly good at just matching whatever their environment throws at them. Right. And so if you grow up in an environment where, you know, you're not, it's not okay, or it's not acceptable to express certain feelings or to act a certain way or whatever, then you end up suppressing that as a matter of survival when you're young, but then it kind of becomes a part of your personality when you're an adult, because the, you know, even though you may not be in that environment anymore, it's become sort of a, something that your brain has adapted to. And so. Yeah, absolutely. And and quite often, I mean, the reason, because I guess the, the, I mean, I, one thing I used to argue with myself about this is like, well, if it's part of your personality, then isn't that authentic? Mm -hmm. But I think the fact is, is that the thing that a lot of people experience is that, yeah, there are those parts of themselves that are kind of conformed to society, conformed to their family's beliefs, conformed to all these lessons that they were given when they were growing up about the way that the world should be and the way they should be. But those parts are also conflicting internally with other parts of themselves that, you know, have all these kind of desires and ambitions and dreams and, and needs that aren't being met mm-hmm. the way that they're currently living. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I've actually just finished another ebook, which is going to, I'm probably going to release it in the next week. It's going to be um, free to people who are on my mailing list. Mm. Um, but I talk about that a lot in, in that book. Mm. Um, so and, hear that? So go sign to... up for, e- go sign up for Hannah's email list now so that you can access her book when it comes out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. The book is going to be about the five most common blocks to authenticity and how we can overcome them. Ooh. So I, it's going to be a good introduction to the topic of authenticity and some of the ways that you, some of the things that you can do right now to live more authentically. Yes, that sounds really cool. I'm looking forward to reading that too. And uh, one last thing, I guess I was looking at your website just recently, and I was reminded that you not only have all these wonderful resources, the blog that's free. You know, you're going to be coming out with eBooks that you're just giving away to people very generously. You've got the journaling book and the sentence completion course. But if somebody wants to work with you one-on-one and they want some personal coaching on getting, you know, getting in touch with themselves or any, you know, any specific issue that they're trying to work out or just a general thing, you know, they want to know how to live more authentically, um, you are available for coaching, right? You, you can help them out. Yeah, that's right. So I offer one-to-one coaching over Skype and also over email because I, I appreciate that some people, it's either not practical for them to talk over Skype or maybe they um, they feel a bit worried about having, a, it's quite personal having a, even a phone conversation with someone. So I offer the opportunity for people to just email me as well and we can have email correspondence. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then that's right on the top of your website as well. And, uh, you know, on the slider yep. bar in the front page, it says coaching. You can just link to that. Yeah, and I also just want to mention, um, just to really plug my website, um, I have a list of resources as well, which is going to be updated imminently. I haven't updated it for a while, but um, it's one of the, the next things on my website overhaul list is to update my list of resources. And I've tried to compile um, all of the online resources, books, um, different people, different websites, different tools and applications and audio stuff as well. All the stuff that I have found really helpful over the past six or seven years. Um, so it's quite a big list and it's, as I said, imminently it's going to get much, much bigger as well. Um, 
So I hope that that, that can be useful too. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure it will. And cool. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me today, Hannah. I really love talking to you and I'm sure that we're going to be working together some more in the future. All right. One more time, becoming who you are. Dot net. And dot my, net. Yeah. yeah, dot net. That's important. And then, um, my website, porktherapy.com. It's P O R C therapy.com. And there you can find my weekly podcast and radio show and often bonus content too. And I've got a little RSS at the top of my site in case you want to subscribe and make sure you get all the content when it comes out. So, okay, Hannah, thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you next time. Great. Thank you so much for the amazing work you did on the audiobook and for having me back on the show. It's been a real pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks, Hannah. Okay. Bye. for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life.